Here we are in Harare, in Zimbabwe. I'm together with Shaheen Metar, Professor Shaheen Metar, who has been working in the regions for years, Shaheen, right? That's true. And yes. controlling hemorrhagic fever and getting the food and herself in the field to help people. Shaheen, thank you for being with us and thank you for sharing with us the difficulties here in the region and the experience and the future of Ebola control. You're very welcome and thank you for coming and making our story public. Thank you thank so Thank you. Much. I guess that ICANN, which is the Infection Control Network of Africa, will really benefit from the huge effort that has been ongoing here in Africa. We are looking towards donations and support. We have the expertise, we just need to move it out. We just want to make sure that everybody understands we are well-trained infection control practitioners all over Africa. We just need to mobilize them. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much again. Let me ask you a few questions. Oh, good afternoon, I'm uh, uh, Professor Shaheen Mehta. I am the chair of the Infection Control Africa Network and it's a great privilege to be heading up this very young and fledgling organization which is involved with providing infection control training and support from uh, all over Africa and we call it an education program which is the Cape to Cairo program. We are involved with also making sure that we have support for healthcare workers who are dealing with uh, various types of diseases, including viral hemorrhagic fevers. As we know at the moment, we are, having, we are in the grips of a big epidemic. Thank you, Shane. How long have you been working facing hemorrha hemorrhagic fevers? Well, it's a really interesting question. I actually was first time came across Lassa fever when it was the very first case in the United Kingdom, which was actually in 1980. And since then, I have been involved with the hemorrhagic fever outbreak in Gulu, which was in the year 2000 and was out there helping and trying to work with them. Um, and then since then, I've always had an interest in seeing how things are going and what we have, which is a very typically an African disease at the moment. So we need to make sure that we know as much about it as possible. Tell me now, uh, what is new in respect to this Ebola situation in West Africa? What has been happening is that there's a cycle. There's been going in a cyclic manner, but we have been not watching it closely enough because it's very poor surveillance. So every two or three years we have a cycle. This one has been different in that there's been a big explosion and it appears that in 2012 and 13 there was a very silent epidemic of Ebola amongst the great apes which went unnoticed. The first contact with humans was on was in December 2013 which started which was the epicenter and then started the big outbreak. So this was slightly different to the previous ones where there was no data but there was was considered to be con uh, contamination from fruit bats, bush meat, and contact with animals in the rural regions. Okay, thank you. What are the lessons learned from these current epidemic? The first and the most important lesson is that we must involve the community. Look for the traditional leaders when you go into the country. Look for people that lead the community's thoughts and processes. Get them on your side because they're the ones who actually know what's going on at grassroots level. And make sure that, they, that you're friends with them and that you're working with them and not against them. And it makes a big, big difference in the way things are going on. So I think from that point of view, we are quite keen to make sure that our first lesson is that. The second one is we have to make sure that we have systems of surveillance in place so people know what's happening and that there's information. The third one has got to be about how we handle and deliver the message of PPE. There's been major confusion about what is happening, what we should wear, every organization has got its own. And now that we've got the new WHO guidelines, I suggest all of us should adapt them. And in fact, ICANN has adapted them. So it's quite a good idea to make sure that this, this happens. Following on from that, we need to make sure that the institutions that are working, that we recruit people, but most, most, most importantly, that we have training. We need to train people. The more we train, the better the knowledge, the less the fear, and we can handle people properly, and we can give the community the respect it deserves. So the lesson, among the lessons learned, what are the most important for you? The most important is training education not only of the healthcare workers but also of the community. Let them understand together what needs to be done. Respect for culture and tradition. 
making sure that everybody works as a team. At the moment, there's very disparate situations going on and we need to pull them all together. We need good leadership. We need coordination and we need to make sure that we are making, allowing our healthcare workers to work in a safe environment. Now let me ask you a question. How do you explain the discrepancy or relative discrepancy between the low impact of the current epidemic situation in the three different countries and the impact of malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS for many years in the region? Do you understand? What's the difference? Why is it that now the international community is reacting? Well, the reason that uh, it's quite evident. I mean, we have an, ende uh, an endemic uh, problem with TB, malaria and HIV and so on. The reason Ebola suddenly became very important was because it went across the waters. It went into the high income countries. The lives of Americans and Europeans were now going to be at risk and they had to do something. And the idea was that you make sure Ebola stays in West Africa. We don't want it coming into our part of the world. And so a lot of effort has gone into making sure that it stays where it is. Thank you. And now, uh, it seems to me that time has come to mobilize the international community around Marburg disease, Lassa fever and Ebola. So that research and development, including vaccines, would be funded by international public money. We don't want to wait again for a large mobilization next time. What is your opinion? My opinion is that that is a perfect idea. We need to make sure that everybody understands that we are working together, that we have to make sure there's a vaccine available, that we are, we are going to get another epidemic in 2018, just looking at the cycle of the way things are going. We must be ready for it. We cannot afford to have 10,000 people dying or, or sorry, getting infected and half of them dying in an environment like this. So it's of the utmost importance that vaccines and preventative measures are put into place as fast as possible. Now, why did we had to wait for almost 40 years before a vaccine against Ebola would be made available. What, was it possible to anticipate the current situation? I think that's an unfair question to ask me because I live here. The answer is yes. Had it affected a different group of people, shall we say, then the vaccine would have been out a long time ago. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>